Firstly, tonight is our 17th program of the year already. What are we in? June. It's crazy, right? I mean, I remember once upon a time we only did 12 programs in one year. Now we're doing, we're up to 17. We're aiming for 46 by the end of this year. For those that do not know, my name is Stuart Schlossman. And yes, I too have multiple sclerosis. And that is how this all began. That's another story. Too long for tonight. I'm not going to get into that. MS Views and News, that's what you need to hear about. MS Views and News provides educational programs for everybody affected by multiple sclerosis, whether you're the patient or the caregiver. We want to make sure that you're getting information that you may not be getting from your own communities or where you're you know, seeing a doctor or a clinician or a nurse practitioner or somebody. We want to make sure that you're getting all the information that you can possibly learn about anything to do with MS, which is, again, the reason for visiting the MS Views and News Learning Channel on YouTube, as well as just coming to our programs. Tonight, you're going to hear a different format. But before I get into all of that, I want to let you know that we want to thank our sponsors of tonight's program. And so I would like to thank Genzyme, a Santa Fe company, who provides you with, or for some of you, with Obagio or Lemtrada. You're going to not really hear about that tonight because I think the doctor is going to be speaking about other things than the MS meds, but you can hear about it by, again, looking at our learning channel or, or attending our other programs. Also, for those that don't know, MS Views and News now employs a social worker, right? She's down in Miami. Her name is Jennifer Falk. How many know her? One table. Imagine that. They're all out of Miami, too. So, Anyway, we do want to thank Jennifer. Jennifer is now providing a community resource for anybody in the state of Florida with MS or caregivers, and she's there to provide you with resources about things that you may need to know how to pay a light bill or how to find a specific doctor or how to get transportation or just in general. Maybe you just need a psychologist to talk with or whatever. Anything to do with MS that you do not know the resource for, you guys can go and... And, and speak with her about this. OK, so now, talking about tonight's program, we're going to have Dr. Steingo, Dr. Harris, and Jeff Siegel. And Dr. Steingo is going to speak about the self-aspects, some sexual issues, a little bit about nutrition, supplements, and other things, while Dr. Harris then will come up and speak about the impact of MS on dating, as well as on the family dynamics, parenting, and other things. You all have agendas at your table. You can see what it is that is being discussed tonight. After the two of them speak, we will then do Q&A, all right? So please hold, gentlemen, please hold your questions for then. By the way, again, if you didn't notice, tonight's program, our first ever men's health issues with multiple sclerosis. And so during the Q&A, we are going to ask all women that are here tonight to vacate the room, okay? And we do this for our programs that we have for women's health issues with multiple sclerosis. We ask all the men to vacate the room during the Q&A, so that way for anybody who has anything very discreet that they want to ask questions about or just ask other men in the room, you know, things that, you know, might help them. So, again, it's just going to be a little bit more intimate, but not being that intimate, okay? All right. Then, after the Q&A, we'll have the women come back in the room, and then Jeff Siegel is going to speak about um, some of the uh, exercise or stretching or different things that will help you to reduce pain. And then we'll be done, except that then you'll have the raffle, okay? So we're ready to get started. Without any further ado, let's welcome Dr. Steingo. All yours. It's up to you. What about that thing? What about that? Thank you, Stuart. 17 programs in a year, is in, 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 five, in six months, I think it's an amazing job that Stuart does. And for many people that can come to these, to be able to go to YouTube and access some of the programs is, is, is amazing too. And I'm thinking to myself, there are many regular people that I see that are at these programs, and, and there could be three reasons why you could attend one of these programs. The most obvious reason is education. Some people get a lot of education. They get a lot of these programs. They are very educated, or maybe they're a little slower, so they need a lot of repeat stuff. So education is a big reason for coming here. It could be the meal, right? Some people like the food. And it could be socialization. I think the social aspect is very important too. When you meet other people, sometimes you meet new people, being in a group, I think. So there's many reasons why, why people could be, could be here. 
One of the important things about this program tonight, as Stuart told you, is the first time we've done this kind of slant. So you've been to many of these that I've done. Programs for Stuart, pharmaceutical company programs, programs for the MS Society. I've done many different programs. They all have different formats. But the format that Stuart asked me to do tonight is to do this first topic of men's health issues. And whereas I consider that I know a lot about MS, I'm not an expert on all of these issues. Some of them perhaps could be handled by other specialists. And as we go along, we'll talk about that. So it's most important at the end of this program, maybe more important than other programs we've done, that you fill in at the end of it what you liked and what you didn't like and recommendations for future programs. It's very important. It's a learning for us. It's our first one of this type. And your input is, is very important to, to improve this uh, as we go forward. So we'll get started. And uh, you saw that, that as Stuart introduced this, it started out, some of this is generic stuff. Some of this could be talking about things that are generic for anyone with MS. Some of it, as we go along, will concentrate on specific men's health issues. But this is always my introductory slide. And so we're talking tonight about some aspect of the symptoms, the symptom tower. We're talking about some self-help aspects. These are where we're going to concentrate. We're not talking about any of the drugs or relapses or how we diagnose MS necessarily. We're concentrating on these, on these parts tonight more than anything else. I wanted to just introduce to you about what we feel about what MS is. Because when we treat people with MS, we may treat at different stages. So the first thing about MS you know is that in MS we have an autoimmune disease, which means your immune system attacks your own body parts. And in the case of MS, it's the brain, the spinal cord, and the optic nerve. And something triggers this off. And this is what we're trying to learn. What is the trigger? What triggers off the immune system to act on the target, which is the brain, and the spinal cord and the optic nerves. So the brain is the target of this immune attack. Something triggers it off. We don't know what that is. Is it a virus? Is it something in the environment where you grew up in a northern latitude? Is it vitamin D deficiency? Is it your diet? Is it genetic factors? Most likely a combination of all of those things. So you have a genetically susceptible person who is exposed to some virus maybe or low vitamin D and that triggers off the MS which then attacks the target which is the brain, the spinal cord, and the optic nerve. And the first thing that happens is inflammation around the nerve. And when there's inflammation, the myelin is damaged. And that's why you always have read about MS as a demyelinating disease, because the myelin is damaged. Now, when myelin is damaged, there's inflammation. If we treat early enough, there potentially could be some recovery. But underneath the myelin, of course, is the nerve cell, which we call the axon. And if the axon is damaged, it's, 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 um, it's, irre it's uh, irreversible. The axon cannot recover. The damage is permanent. And we will see that as permanent atrophy on the brain and permanent damage. That's why we recommend early treatment. And if there's enough axons that are damaged, it's going to lead to atrophy, which is essentially irreversible. So that's the sequence of events. So when we treat MS, we could perhaps intervene at different stages. The best thing to do, we'd like to find, to be able to intervene up there at the trigger stage, stop the disease, find what's causing it. But we can't do that. So maybe cut down the inflammation reduce the demyelination, these may be steps where drugs could work. This shows you the inflammation. So what this shows you, just to show you the amount of inflammation, is that that bright red in the center of the target is, is a blood vessel. And on the outside, if you look at all the pink on the outside, this is normal brain tissue over here on the outside. And around this blood vessel, that's inflammation. So that's what inflammation, if we could look at an actual plaque or an MS lesion, that's what you would see when you're looking at inflammation. So now how about the symptoms of MS? How do we think about the symptoms of MS? They could present in many ways, and you know that. So when you come for your, for your regular visit, every month or every six months or every year, you could say my symptoms are stable or they're constant. They could be both. They could be constant and stable. And they could, be, they could fluctuate. So your symptoms could be stable, constant, and fluctuate. So you could say, I have some pins and needles. It's there all the time, and I have good and bad days. But it hasn't gotten any worse. The peaks are the same. The good and bad days are always the same. Or you could have a pattern of new symptoms, or you could have progression. And this helps us determine what kind, what kind of MS are we dealing with, how aggressive do we have to be. And they've always said there are certain types of MS. So all those symptoms tell us about the type of MS. I cannot diagnose the type of MS by looking at your scan. People often ask me that. They say, well, what kind of MS do you think I have? I say, I have no clue. 
You are going to give me the clue by your history, by all the things we said on the previous slide. Are your symptoms stable? Are they new? Are they progressing? And so the classic forms of MS, by far the commonest form of MS is called relapsing and remitting MS, which is this kind over here, that over 80 to 90% of people start out with that kind of MS, relapsing and remitting MS. But there are some people that go even before that. And the first thing that happens before that is your very first symptom. We have called that a clinically isolated syndrome. That's when someone has their first event. And we're not always sure if it's going to turn into MS, but the very first event we've been calling in the past a clinically isolated syndrome. Now, the name for that is changing. Sometimes they call it early MS or the first warning or different names. But it's the first symptom before we're absolutely sure it's MS. But even before that, there's another stage that you can see up there, the radiologically isolated syndrome. That is someone that may have no symptoms at all and has a scan coincidentally for some other reason. For example, you have a headache or you bump your head and you have a scan and it looks like you have MS. So it's even an earlier stage where you could suspect that someone might, might be in line to develop MS. So that's the early stages. Now, if you have relapsing rheumatic MS and we don't treat it, what is the outcome? The outcome is that you have a risk of developing progression. And we call that secondary progressive MS. Now, from studies that were done 20 years ago, before we had any drugs at all, we know what happens. That if you have relapsing rheumatic MS and you don't treat it, in 15 years after the diagnosis, 50% of people have progressed. Now, you might say, oh, 15 years. If you think about MS as a disease, it usually starts at a younger age, 20 to 40, and you add 15 years, you're now looking at 35 to 50, and you have a 50% chance of progression. That's you know, significant. How about after 25 years, 80% of people have progressed without treatment? So now, if you, again, if you start at 20 to 45, and you add 25 years, you're looking at 45 to 60, 70, and you have an 80% chance that there's progression of this disease. Again, another reason why we want to be more, more active early on. And then finally, at the bottom here, you see this form of MS that occurs in about 10% of people called primary progressive MS, in which, about, in which people slowly progress, usually from the beginning, and very rare in that group of people to have a relapse. The very bottom bullet point shows you that very rare in the progressive form to have a relapse. The clinical symptoms of MS are widespread. For some of you who may have attended our recent meeting that we did to introduce the new uh, tool that we're putting out on MS Views and News. It's called an MS communication tool. And it lists all these symptoms. And so we say to you, every time you go and visit your doctor, this is the symptoms we're going to ask questions. We're going to ask you, do you have any of these symptoms? Because when I look at this in one second, I can see what your symptoms are and which symptoms we're going to discuss for that day. You might write none or stable or chronic or new or whatever you write. But you can tell me about the symptoms. You might say, today I want to discuss fatigue. Or I might want to discuss bladder or bowel problems or sexual dysfunction or whatever problems there are. It's very important to fill this in. It's very helpful to write those symptoms in. And we prefer you to write or circle or say something about your symptoms. I spoke about this before at that meeting too. The one word that is most unhelpful to me or any neurologist is the word the same. Right? Or unchanged. It doesn't help me because oftentimes if we go into it, there's something that is a little different. So it's good. Take your time. Do it the night before. It's going to be on MS Views and News webpage. Is it, is it on the page yet, Stuart? Can, can people find it there yet? I don't know. It's close. It's going to be there where you can fill it in and then bring it in. So we can look at this. It helps the visit. So those are the primary symptoms of MS. It depends what part of the brain or the spinal cord is affected, whether your eyes are affected or your walking or your balance or your bowel or your bladder or your memory. These are the secondary symptoms. These are the complications of the problems that just occurred. Because your balance is not good and you feel weak and you feel numb and your vision might be impaired, you fall and you could injure yourself. Many injuries, fractures. Or you could have a urinary tract infection because your bladder is not working. And if an infection is not treated from the urinary tract infection, it goes into your blood. You become septic. You can get kidney problems. In fact, in people with progressive MS, the major cause of decline in health of someone with progressive MS is infections, and urinary tract infections particularly, and then anxiety and depression and all the problems that that leads to. Important to address these and recognize these. The suicide rate and the divorce rate in MS, and maybe Rick will tell you more about that, is high. It is higher than other chronic diseases. So other chronic diseases are disabling. Rheumatoid arthritis is a disabling disease, so is lupus. In fact, the, lupus is a much more severe disease in terms of fatalities, and yet we see more depression in MS than we do in those diseases. And of course, the effect on your activities of daily living. 
And then there's the tertiary symptoms of MS. Because of all the other problems that we've been discussing, you have these other things that happen in your life. Loss of job, family disruption, divorce, social isolation, loss of independence, loss of self-esteem. All very real problems that we have to deal with. So those are the different sets of symptoms of MS that we have to deal with. So we have to deal with the primary symptoms sometimes, sometimes it could be the secondary, sometimes it might be the tertiary. If it's a tertiary symptom, we'll look for help. We will look for help from psychologists, counselors, social workers. The team of people that help you with MS is a big team. Can we predict how you're gonna do? These are risk factors. I'm not sure how that's showing up. Of course, it's all gonna be on YouTube. But when you are diagnosed with MS, there are some risk factors that we're gonna look at to be able to try and predict how you're doing. And the age of onset is one. For example, a younger age of onset actually is a better risk than an older age of onset. The symptoms at onset are important. Uh, again, for example, give some extremes. Optic neuritis is a better onset symptom to have than something that involves the brain stem. So if your initial symptom is a loss of vision, that's a better prognosis than if your initial symptom is difficulty walking, for example, and loss of bladder control. That would be a more severe symptom. And then how the MRI scan looks. The more lesions there are on your MRI scan at the beginning, the worse it is. And then how long between attacks and how many attacks in the first two years, and how much recovery. We add all these things together, and it allows us to somewhat predict what course your MS is gonna have. Now, none of this is written in stone. Someone could have a very bad initial attack and then completely stabilize, or someone could have a very mild initial attack and then go on to have a bad course. So it's not, this is not absolutely written in stone, but it's somewhat predictive and makes us try and determine at the beginning how aggressive should we be with our treatment, and how aggressive should we be when we're changing medications. Uh, so I told you, uh, we talked some about the prognosis before, but about 10 to 20% of people have what's called benign MS. Benign MS means that after about 10 years, you can look at someone and you can pretty much not find any sign of disability. You say small group, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 20. You can't tell that at the beginning always, but you certainly down the road is something you look at down the road. 5% of people have malignant MS. This is a very aggressive group of people that rapidly accumulate disability and become wheelchair bound or even bed bound within five to 10 years. And then the bottom two numbers, the 15 and 20 year numbers, uh, we've discussed those already. So what is the goal of our treatment always? It's to slow down the progression of the disease, reduce relapses, slow disability, reduce your MRI activity, reduce the morbidity from the symptoms put you on a program that you can adhere with, because one of the biggest problems we face with MS is adherence, people taking their medications for a number of reasons. They don't take the medications properly, they don't feel good on the medication, they stop taking it. Insurance issues, they stop taking it. They think they're doing great, so they can take less of the medication than prescribed, and they don't do, so adherence is very important. And we want something as far as possible that's got some long-term effectiveness and safety. Again, this will be on YouTube, I don't know how this is showing up there. This is the to me, the, always when I look at this slide, the most amazing slide in terms of MS treatment. In that if you, feel, if you think back, the first medication approved for MS that you can see over here was 1993. Beta serum was approved, and then Avonex and Copaxone in 96, and we go along the way. Uh, this is a scale that's not uh, to scale, at least these dates. And then we have these latest three medications, Tecfidera, which is actually a couple of years old now. Lemtrada approved about six months ago. Plegrity, a new version of Avonex, new version of interferon beta 1A, and then some drugs in research. But why this is amazing to me always is that in 1993, our first drug came out. If we were sitting here talking in April 1993, we'd be thinking and hoping something's coming soon, knowing it's along the way, but nothing. So when I started practicing neurology, there was nothing to do for MS other than treat symptoms. You could use baclofen, you could use something for the bladder, there was nothing else to modify the course of this disease. And most neurologists didn't want to touch MS at that time because you're looking at a young person generally and you're saying, I don't have anything to offer you. Not, not a very nice experience. So this to me is an amazing kind of slide. And there's some drugs and research, ongoing research, other drugs coming on. Stem cells in the future. Stem cells not, not ready yet for prime time. A few something in the future. And then research on vitamin D that we've learned how important vitamin D is essential for MS. They've done studies clearly showing that people that have low vitamin D have a higher rate of progression. And other simple drugs that are out there that may have some role for MS, statins, tetracycline, other drugs that might also help MS. Which leads to this self-help aspect over here. And this was my first acronym that you can see there, Fresh Minds. 
And then uh, on another night when I was drinking something that makes you feel happy, um, Team of Friends became my new acronym. And if you have another acronym, I always like to look at acronyms. I love acronyms and there's another acronym. All the things that you need to think about and do with yourself and your support groups and your friends. Uh, heat control, mental aspects, sleep, the importance and all these things are interrelated. If you don't sleep well, you have more fatigue. So all these things interrelate. Exercise. If you exercise, you have less fatigue. All these things are important. Keep up with the news. Vitamin D got a separate heading other than nutritional and diet because it's such an important thing. And not smoking. These are all things you do for yourself. So these are things, if you come and see me and I'm saying, what can, what can I do for myself? I'm going to say, right off the bat, eat a healthy diet, don't smoke, take vitamin D, exercise. If you do some of these things, you, you help yourself tremendously. And if you don't do them, you're not helping yourself. You're not part of the team. and You're the most important part of this team. This is a quote that somebody wrote that I liked. And it's an old quote. Some of you may have seen this. Have, you, have any of you seen this quote before? I, I, I like this quote. There's another quote I'll have later. But there are two great quotes that I'd see. And this one says, I'll read it to you. While MS is a physical experience, it is also a social one. MS does not belong to those of us who get it but to our mothers and fathers, our sisters and brothers, our partners and our children, to those who cared for us, to those who saw us in us, tablets on which to write their fear, their pity, their admiration, their empathy, and their discomfort. I don't know if everybody is amazed at this quote like I am. I think it's just a brilliant summary of what MS is. It is not a solitary disease. There are other people involved, many people involved. And if they all work together, this is when we have the best outcome. I mean, I, I, the first time I read this, I was quite touched by it. And still when I read it, actually, when I put this, these slides together the other night, I called my wife over and I said, you know, have a look at this. Do you think I should put this in? And, and she, I mean, she just said, yeah, without a doubt. And there's another one coming up. You'll see that's, to me, equally important. Um, let's see. How do the, how the colors playing out at the back with the blue and the yellow there? Yeah, well, terrible. Yeah. terrible? How they write it, how the colors right at the back? <laughs> you think I should reverse I should reverse them maybe? Maybe a blue background on yellow? Black print. Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, at least it's all gonna be on YouTube. So I thought, you know, blue and yellow would be good, but it looks to me I'm looking at not that great. Okay. So we get the specific symptom we're gonna talk about first in terms of men's health is gonna be sexual dysfunction. And obviously, any neurologist that treats any aspect of MS has to know about depression, sexual dysfunction, pain, things like that. Sometimes, though, these problems go beyond my expertise or any neurologist's expertise. If you have severe problems with bladder or sexual dysfunction or pain or mental health, I will refer you to some other specialist. But I, at least in general, have to know about all these things. And so I'm going to introduce all these things to you from the standpoint of me, how I see them, and when I ask the questions. If, we have, if, there, if there are questions in depth about these things, I might have to send you to a urologist. Or some of the treatments you're going to see over here that I'm going to tell you about, I might have to send you to a urologist. But I'm at least going to introduce it to you now, uh, tonight. So changes in sexual function in MS are very common. 70% of people with MS have some kind of sexual dysfunction. And that goes through all the sexual phases. So it's early on in the sexual phase. Desire and arousal, libido, desire, or any other phase of the sexual response that can occur. Uh, from a male standpoint, erection, ejaculation, orgasm, resolution, every part of the phase. So the beginning of it, the actual, the actual act of it, the end of it, every phase of sexual dysfunction uh, can be involved. And the important thing is it can be a very early symptom. So early on, there can be sexual dysfunction. Just like early on, there can be memory problems. And it's often a sensitive and embarrassing topic. Some people don't feel like talking about it. So you have all extremes. Some people are completely open, and some people are very embarrassed to talk about it. So communication is important. If you don't bring up the topic for discussion, we can't discuss it. So it's a very important topic. Some people want to discuss it alone, some people with their significant other. It's a very important to bring it up, though. And you find out right from the beginning with your doctor, can you help me with this? And I say, yes, I can discuss some aspects with you, but then I will review the problem and say, the nature of your problem is that I'm going to refer you to a urologist because that's who's going to treat you further. So I'm, as I mentioned before, in the land of MS communication tool, this is one of the symptoms listed. 
It's an important symptom. It's an important symptom of someone's mental health. Uh, so discussion could start right away. In the very first time you're going to see me in my office, any neurologist, we're going to ask you that question. And this question often will go with your bladder and your bowel and sexual dysfunction. Those are often going to go together. So here's some associations I put at the bottom that are times when we would be particularly concerned about this. When there's a change in the disease activity, someone could have a change in disease activity, more spasticity in the legs, they feel weaker, they feel more fatigued, it impacts on their sexual function. A change in mental health, someone's depressed, or they're on an antidepressant affecting sexual function. And when there are bladder and bowel problems, commonly affect sexual function. And there's changes in medications. A lot of medications can affect sexual function, as you'll see over here. So this over here refers to primary sexual dysfunction again. The sexual dysfunction directly could be due to MS, such as loss of libido, erectile dysfunction and ejaculation dysfunction, impaired genital sensations, Numbness, paresthesias, tingling, pain, discomfort can affect any nerves in the body. Uh, bladder spasticity. So someone is in the middle of the act and they, their bladder starts to act up. Or their bowel. How do you deal with these problems between patient and significant other? Fatigue, pain, tremor, all these things. Mental health, cognitive impairment, mood and behavioral issues. Inappropriate sexual desire, lack of sexual desire. All these are things that can happen uh, that we need to deal with. How about medications and sexual dysfunction? So here what I've listed for you, some medications that are used for MS that commonly can be associated with sexual dysfunction. A lot of antidepressants can cause some sexual dysfunction. The commonly used tricyclic an uh, uh, antidepressants, Elevil, amitriptyline has been around for a long time, but the other group called SSRIs can also cause some sexual dysfunction. Wellbutrin perhaps is one antidepressant that causes less of that. Spasticity. Stiff muscles, stiffness, hard to move the muscles, they tighten up, they have spasms. Baclofen and tizanidine used for that can affect sexual function. Anti-seizure medications can affect sexual function. A lot of the antihypertensive medications, antihistamines, muscle relaxers, a lot of those can affect sexual function. Now the anticholinergics are put at the bottom, used for the bladder often, uh, are not a common problem in males, they could be, they cause dryness of membranes. Other issues to be considered. Maybe your sexual dysfunction is due to other conditions. For example, sexual dysfunction is very common in diabetics. If people have cardiovascular disease, heart disease, depression, all these other diseases, sexual dysfunction is very common. So we need to think that maybe these could be contributing as well. In fact, in a younger person with sexual dysfunction, we need to be sure that it's not a sign of heart disease. Often the very first sign of heart disease in a young person is inability to have an erection because the, the vessels, the blood vessels that su bring, supply blood to the penis are, are atherosc are hardened and there's inadequate blood flow and it's a sign that there could be inadequate blood flow to other organs as well. And then social, cultural, psychological issues and I listed some of the quotes over there. I can't be a caretaker and a lover. This isn't the same person I married. With everything else going on now, sex is the last thing I care about now. She doesn't find me attractive now I'm a burden. And this is all from, this, uh, from the N uh, National MS Society has a professional resource center with some booklets on sexual dysfunction. Uh, Frederick Foley, uh, you, some of you may have heard, he's actually been down here with some MS programs. Maybe still sometime we can even call him. He has a brilliant lecture on sexual function. Somebody could look up Frederick Foley. And so this is uh, management of sexual function Assess all the factors. Is there something else going on? Assess the general health. Psychological factors. What medications are you on? To treat other conditions, your, your hypertension, other conditions other than, the, other than just the neurological condition. Psychological considerations. You'll hear more about that. Counseling, education, communication. And if your physician, your neurologist is not comfortable talking about it, then we will refer you to a urologist who's comfortable talking about it. What are the expectations? Society's attitudes, people's attitudes, stress management, anger management. Some people could be very frustrated and angry about this situation. And so these are all issues that we need to deal with to make it comfortable to handle this. Reinvent yourself, that says, I won't go into that one tonight. That requires a different session, maybe yourselves. Uh, sex therapy and seeing a sex therapist. There are people, even in Broward County, we have a couple of people that, that call themselves sex therapists. They will help you how to deal with this using various techniques, visualization techniques and other things like that. 
And so here it talks about some of the urological approaches that I don't claim to be the expert on, but I'll introduce you to them. And the first one you can see over there is medications. And so these medications have helped some people considerably since they came out, and that is Viagra, Cialis, which even comes in a once-a-day medication, and Levitra. Well, that's spelled wrong, but that's, that's the three medications that can be used, and they all work by increasing blood flow to the penis. That's essentially how they work. You have to watch out for the other medications. Remember, I always talk about drug interactions between all medications, that these can interact, especially if you've taken nitrates for heart disease, and you could have lowering of blood pressure, they can affect the eyes, they have other side effects, nasal congestion, sinus problems. So this is the first group of medications that's used. And then the second group of things they talk about are mechanical aids. And the purpose of some of these mechanical aids, like vacuum devices and penile constriction rings, is to increase the blood flow to the penis. So if there's increased blood flow, it will enable, improve uh, the ability to have an erection. And penile injections can be done. Uh, hormones, check testosterone levels, and even doing a penile prosthesis. So there are some mechanical things that can be done. So besides the drugs, there are mechanical things that can be done and actually are quite effective. You need to seek out a urologist that's comfortable with these. Uh, some of these are more permanent, like a prosthesis. Some of them, like a penile constriction ring or vacuum device, are things that you use when you need them. And for example, the vacuum device may go around the penis and then it pr prevents the blood from draining out and will promote an erection. That's, that's the end of that section that I wanted to talk about on uh, sexual dysfunction. And the next section I thought that could be relevant to this to a meeting is talking about work and MS. In general, in our society, this is a changing thing, but in general, if you look back at society, men have been the breadwinners. And a man who's a breadwinner and can no longer function is a very stressful, severe situation. In our society, things are evolving. There are many more families where men and women are equally contributing to the household income, or where the woman even is the primary breadwinner. This is happening more than it used to happen. Still, though, I thought this would be an issue to touch on about the effect of work and MS. So if you have problems with MS, these are some problems that you could come up with. Can you continue working? When do you make the decision to work or not? And do you tell someone, your employer, when do you tell them? How do you tell them? Who do you tell? These are all very important questions. And then you have to decide, what are you limited due to? So some limitations are limitations that you may be able to compensate for very well. If you have fatigue, can you take, off a, can you take a break and rest during the day? Cognitive decline, accessibility. Are you near to a bathroom? If you have a bladder problem, can you be in a situation where you're near to a bathroom? Can you park your car in a handicapped parking? I mean, it's the thing I see all the time. Someone can't get hand, they won't let them park in a handicapped parking. Ridiculous things that you see. Do you have an employer who's kind? Or are you dealing with somebody who I will not describe in a public forum with inappropriate words. So, stress, heat, bladder and bowel problems. These are all things that come into how you compensate at work. And you could compensate for some of these. If you have a bladder problem and you can't walk and you have a wheelchair, you're near a bathroom, so you can get there, maybe you have some rest during the day. The one of these that is the most limiting for work, of course, is cognitive problems. Because we can compensate for a lot of physical problems. You can be near a bathroom, you can use a wheelchair to get there, but if there are cognitive problems and a loss of memory, then you cannot function very well. And in fact, the greatest cause for young people not working and becoming unemployed is cognitive problems. So here's some strategies. Again, it's to initiate communication. So this includes initiating communication with your neurologist, because if you're going at some point to be looking for disability, we need to start documenting that you're gonna be on disability. And when people start to talk to me about disability and ask me the question, when should they go on disability, I say, I'm not going to make that decision. I'd like you to be working and mentally stimulated as long as you can do it. But if we start to talk about it, let's start documenting it. And if you think there's a threat at work, then preempt them and maybe go on short-term leave. Because the disaster that I've seen is people not going on disability and then being, quote, let go. Because the position is no longer there. Well, if you let go, everything goes. Insurance goes, disability goes, now what do you do? It's a disaster. So preempt them, go for short-term disability first. And then you have time now to think about, do I want long-term disability? Do I need to see if there's adaptations they can make? What's my safety? And you'll see in the next page, people that are gonna help you deal with this. Improve attitudes, employers that have improved attitudes. Hopefully you'll find one. There are some out there. New laws, better resources, we'll talk about those. The accommodations, altered work schedule, adaptive equipment, temperature control, all important things to help you work longer. Make it cooler. 
be closer to the bathroom, all adaptive things that you could do. And these over here are some of the things and places and organizations that can maybe help you that you can see out there. ADA centers, Americans with a Disabilities Act, disability.gov, Family and Medical Leave Act, Job Accommodation Network, Social Security Online, U.S. Department of Justice, U.S. Department of Labor Office, U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity, Vocational Education. There's a bunch of these, and some are better than others, and some might help you and some not. But there are a bunch of things out there that, that can be used, and you have to be an activist for yourself as well to try and get these things done. You may need a social worker to help you with some of these and recommend where the best place is to go. So that could be important too. If you're applying for disability, I always say get advice before you apply. How many people, I don't, don't even, I'm not even asking you to show hands, but how many people have applied for Social Security and been turned down the first time? Many. So be prepared for it. If you do all the steps before that, you have a much higher chance of being approved. The financial impact of MS in the workplace. So this, this, this is saying basically that you can see at the bottom there, look at this number here. An average annual cost for disability, uh, 3,868 versus $414 in the US. More disability days in MS and other chronic diseases, 29.8 versus 4.5. And a higher percentage of people claiming short or long-term disability, 21.4% of people with MS versus 5.2% in the general population. Uh, this is looking again more at disability. The baseline MS-related medical costs higher for treated versus untreated uh, employees. The medical costs. But the risk adjusted total annual medical costs and indirect costs were significantly lower for treated versus untreated people. So if you had everything together, treated people cost less than people that are untreated. That's what this study tended to show. The effect of therapy on, on unemployment lost time. Basically what this slide shows you is that when people were on therapy, there was less time lost, fewer days absent with all the drugs. This was looking at GA, which is Copaxone, Avonex and Betaseron, the three drugs. On all three drugs, you can see that people had fewer days absent when they were on medication. Just to give you an example, just to look at this. For example, if you look at short-term disability, now let's, let's rather take any reason at all. This one over here on the right-hand side. If people were on all these drugs, for example, Copaxone, 50 days less disability, less, less absent time from work, or on Avonex or Interferon, beta, Interferon Beta 1A or B, less days absent from work when people are on treatment. That's the point of this slide. Okay, this one has some, uh, well, that's, that's not too good. That's black on blue. You know, usually I'm doing these slides late at night and I'm trying colors and I guess, you know, I'm sitting in a little room in front of the computer, so can anybody see this beside me? No? <laughs> um, this, says, uh, this says the Marlins are playing the uh, Blue Jays tonight and it's the top of the first and the score is 4-3. Yeah, it doesn't say that, but I'll read it to you. But it's going to be on YouTube if you want to see it and I'll read it to you. It says the annual cost of MS in the US is, this is, 19, nine, this is old studies, it hasn't been done. So whatever number you're going to see here, you can probably double this first number. The annual cost of, of, and it's the only one I could find that gave the annual cost. The annual cost of MS in the US in 1994 is $13.6 billion. Now I told you before that in 1994, the first drug, beta serum, was the only drug approved. Now we have 12 approved medications that are expensive. Could you imagine what the cost is of MS now? It's one of the most expensive drugs. It's why every day I have at least one fight with some insurance company medical director, at least one. It could be about a drug like this that costs $70,000 a year, or it could be that somebody needs a wheelchair repair that they don't want to approve. This is what I have to fight about sometimes, it's ridiculous. But the cost must be, if it was $13 billion in 1994, who knows what it is now, you can imagine. It says the total lifetime direct and indirect cost per patient is estimated at $2 million. And that's also clearly much higher. So there's some numbers over here. I'm not going to belabor it. It's a very expensive disease is what this says. Anybody who wants to look up, I'll, I'll change this around again. If we get a slide, put the slide in future presentations. Clearly, I will change the colors and uh, it'll be easy to see. But it will be on YouTube for you to see. And this, basically what this slide says, and I guess it's just equally difficult to see. Maybe it's a little easier to see. 
So what this slide says on the left-hand side over here is you see over here on the left-hand side, I think the pointer, the pointer's on the blink. Yeah, the pointer has expired. So on the left-hand side, you see that it says a disability rating. EDSS is our disability scale. EDSS of 0 to 3.5 is mild disability. EDSS of 4 to 6, 4 is someone who has trouble walking, but they can walk a fair distance. A 6 is someone who uses a cane. A 6.5 to a 9.5 is severe disability. 6.5 is someone using a walker. Nine point, uh, an EDSS of 9 is someone who's bedridden. So the greater the disability, you can see on that scale that much, obviously, as you'd expect, the greater the cost. So, for example, the total cost of mild disability is about $14,000. Moderate is $31,000. Severe disability, estimate 2004 study that was done, published $47,000 per year, cost of care. The greater the disability, the greater the cost of care. Let's see if this part is working. Well, this one's working. Here's the other quote that I liked as well, to do with the ego. When you have MS and you can't work and your sexual function is impaired and you have other complaints and so could it affect your ego? And I, I think this is a slide, I don't know if you've seen this slide before, another quote that I also obtained, this was from an old MS uh, article, MS Society article said, uh, I don't think this is a person called Robert Gurney who wrote, I don't think that my disability really changed anything as far as my relationship with my wife and children. When our daughter Louise was in school, she must have been very little, the teacher said to her, your dad is Bob Gurney. He is the one who's handicapped. She, well, Louise told her, no, he's not. He's my daddy. I like that too. I mean, you're still, because you have MS, you, you got to still, you're still, a, you're still the same person you always were. Everybody I know that's been my patient for two years or 20 years is the same person. They're, they've changed in some ways but they're the same person and they deserve the same respect and you've got to work and that's where you become part of this whole team. And so I thought this was another great quote is why I put it in. And you can address some of that, but anxiety and depression, memory, cognitive problems, clutter management. Clutter management is very important, being disorganized. If you're disorganized, it's just a cascading series of events. You get disorganized, you can't find something, you leave something else, it just becomes, so clutter management, actually there, have been paper, there has been recently a paper that I read on clutter management in MS. It's very important to throw out stuff that you don't need and try and become uncluttered. So it's very important. Support groups are important, whatever they may be, even this kind of support group. And then I'll put this at the bottom over here, the bucket list of what to do. Because everybody has a bucket list of what to do, right? Most people, I would like to do this. I want to go here and there. But what's equally important, I like to say, is a bucket list of what not to do. And this should be something that, that you know, should be in the front page of the newspaper and the front of the news every night, and of course it isn't. What not to do. And this applies to people without MS as well as to all people with MS. Be tolerant. Just like you want someone to be tolerant of you, you need to be tolerant of someone, understand that it's, they're having difficulty dealing with your disabilities as well. Give them time to understand. Some people will and some won't, because all humans are different. So be tolerant. Forgiveness, patience, generosity. And these are all things of things to do. And so the things not to do, and don't be impatient. Don't be unforgiving. Don't be intolerant. These are all things that are important, I think, in your mental health. Uh, I'm not going to go into the mental health issue, but it's basically pharmacologic, meaning medications, or non-pharmacologic, meaning having counseling, learning relaxation techniques, and things of that nature. Social support of all kinds of things. Social relationships, social networks, emotional support, material support, information support. All these things are very important also in strengthening your, your dealing with this disease. Uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about cognitive dysfunction, which is a very common thing in MS and a very disabling thing, so I won't go in. I've got all these slides are all going to be on YouTube that you can have a look at. Uh, I said cognitive function is very important. People with MS can have problems with memory, attention, and concentration. Multitasking, processing, all these are important things that can happen. Uh, we won't go into detail about, mental about the cognitive treatment, except that it's very important that you remain mentally active and constantly do mental activities, whatever they might be. Whether it's what people often call, people often say to me, they do luminosity. 
Anybody here do luminosity? There is no such thing, really. It's called lumosity, but people do it. Lumosity or fit brains or crossword puzzles or Sudoku or, or games, all that kind of stuff is very important. But remember, all these things interact. Mental function, fatigue, exercise, they all interact. If you don't exercise, you're going to be more fatigued. If you're more fatigued, you don't sleep well, your cognitive process may be slower. So all these things interact uh, very much with each other. So the exercise part is very important. Exercise helps both physical function and exercise helps cognitive function. So we need to do all of these things uh, in, in improving uh, your general health. Um, I have a few more slides, but I think, I think I need, I'm going to end over there. So, uh, okay? Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So... Next up is Dr. Rick Harris, who's a psychologist, and he's out of the Weston area. And you're going to have to listen, because Dr. Harris doesn't speak loud. Even with a microphone, he doesn't speak loud. So everybody just listen carefully, please. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you, Stu. Um, first of all, I just wanted to applaud all of the guys that showed up tonight. Um, most women know this about us, guys. Um, I, I'm going to reveal our secrets, um, even though we've got a couple women in the audience. Most of us guys deal with obstacles in our life by retreating to our man caves. We withdraw. We don't want to talk about issues. We withdraw. So for you all to come out here this evening, I really appreciate it and applaud you. So th thanks for coming out, especially when the NBA Finals are on this evening. So I really applaud you for coming out. How, how many are Cleveland fans in here? No, Golden State. Yeah. Yes, all right. Um, I, I, I want you to do me a favor. Just take a minute. And I want you to look around the room. And I want you to look at all of the guys that are here this evening, because you all are a special fraternity. And I want you to do, realize that you're not alone in your struggles and dealing with your obstacles of a mess. Look around the room. We're all in this together. And there's a real comforting feeling to know that we're not the only ones uh, dealing with this. So we're going to play a little MS trivia right now. So in, in the spirit of not being alone, I came across some guys who have MS. So does anyone know who Richard Cohen is? Help me. Who's Richard Cohen? I'm sorry? That's, that's right. He's also a Emmy-winning TV producer, MS. This one we should know. Jack Osborne, Ozzy's son. O o Ozzy was diagnosed with MS at age 26. Um, and the good news is that through a real rigorous treatment program of exercise and medication, he's doing really well. Montel Williams. Yeah, Montel Williams, a, a very famous talk host. David and Alan Osmond. How many of all remember the Osmond family? Um, David was one of the Osmonds, and Alan was, is his son, um, MS. Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor. And I want to read a, a little bit, a, a quote. I know um, Dr. Steingo shared some of his favorite um, quotes um, with you. This is a a quote that Richard Pryor said, God gave me this MS shit to save my life. And I want you to think about that. 
MS saved Richard Pryor's life. And that's really a healthy attitude, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. All right, who knows who Clive Burr is? Come on, you all classic rock and rollers. Drummer for Iron Maiden. <laughs> and of course, Squiggy. That's right, exactly right. Squiggy, Laverne, and Shirley. So, you know, despite, we're going to talk about some of the obstacles we face as men um, with MS. But before I do that, I want to offer the hope. You know, despite many obstacles, most, most men living with MS do well. But what's the difference? How are we different from women? Um, first of all, women get more women get MS. And when we look at RRMS, it's four to one women to men. But when we look at just primary progressive, the ratio is one to one. So more women are affected by, by MS than we are as, as guys. So let, let's talk about obstacles to living with MS. We're going to identify we, what we have to deal with as guys with MS. And then what I'm hoping to do, and my wish, is that when you leave tonight, maybe you've learned a little bit something about how to deal with the obstacles better. That's all. That's my wish tonight. And hopefully my gift to you is maybe that you'll learn a better way to deal with some of these obstacles. Um, Dr. Steingo talked um, about depression. And, and certainly prevalence among um, people who have depression with MS is upwards of 54%. Uh, percent. You know, and what's important is depression not only affects women, but also us guys. And it's important for you all to understand, what is depression? And, and so often I get asked, you know, Doc, I'm sad. I've been diagnosed with MS. What is the difference between depression and sadness? First of all, there's a depressed mood. The depressed mood is more than just feeling sad. There's other symptoms associated with depression as well. Diminished interest, a loss of interest in all activities. Um, weight loss or weight gain. Some people lose their appetite. Others have what I call carbo craving, where they just eat. They want to eat more, and they gain weight. We see difficulty with sleep, sleeping with depression. Some people can't fall asleep, can't maintain their sleep, and others just want to sleep all of the time. There's a sense of feeling agitated, as well as some people feel really laden, that we call it psychomotor retardation. And then, of course, fatigue. And as you can see, some of these symptoms of depression are very similar to the very symptoms that we talk about with MS. So it becomes very important to be able to discriminate what is depression and what are the symptoms of MS. There's feelings of worthless or guilt. Um, a diminished ability to think. And certainly with MS, we can have cognitive impairment, uh, impairment and certainly recurrent thoughts of death. As Dr. Steingo said, the incidence of suicide among MS patients is higher than most other chronic illnesses. And certainly we know that the treatment for depression is that there are medications. There's what we call the SSSRs, the tricyclics, and they can be quite effective. However, there's also non-pharmacological treatments, such as nutraceuticals or supplements. Um, for those of you that um, watch public television, you see Daniel Amen on TV talking all about um, attention deficit disorder. Well, he's done a lot of research, and there are some nutraceuticals or supplements that can really help um, with depression. SAMI, 5-HTP are all amino acids that can be very, very helpful. 
Um, the, what we know is there's not one just intervention that helps for, help for medication. When we combine interventions such as exercise, diet, and medications, and counseling, we see a much better um, response um, to medications. The other thing that Dr. Uh, Stango raised, another obstacle, is anxiety. Um, we know that anxiety is very common among um, MS, that 16 to 48% of all people with MS will have anxiety. Um, it's often noticed alongside the first symptom of S, MS. Of course, it's understandable we would experience anxiety because the course of this disorder or this disease is un predictable. Anxiety is associated with fear. So it's normal for us to experience anxiety. Um, the anxiety about the unpredictability, that's the toughest aspect to deal with. Um, like depression, it can be treated very effectively. However, it's important to understand, again, what is real anxiety and when it does need treatment or it's a normal reaction to what we're experiencing. M and many people find it helpful just to give themselves permission to believe I'll be okay. The other obstacle of MS is the stigma. Our society values physical well-being. Look at all of our, our magazines. The stigma of a chronic illness holds many people back. It's especially true for the young adult, the young guy that gets diagnosed. And we live in this culture of physical perfection to not be able to perform up to our own potential is a real issue that we all struggle with. We, we look at magazines and what do we see? Beautiful people. That's our ideal. We don't see people who have a disability in magazines. It's a real stigma in our country to have um, a chronic illness. And, and, and this stigma prevents and interferes with our connections and our social support. Because not only do we have this stigma, but we're reluctant to reach out, to ask for help. And that's what I'm really glad that you all are here this evening because you're recognizing that, that or overcoming that stigma. The other real obstacle, guys, is who we are as men. Oh, from the time we're little tykes to the time we um, become adults, we're told in the message we get is we are protectors, we are doers, we are earners, we're in control. And if you noticed, I put LOL after that. It's an illusion that we're in control because those of us that are married or have partners know the real truth. I, I, I remember my... <laughs> but guys, I'm not going to break that illusion. We are in control. Um, and also, we try not to talk about our feelings. H how many of you all have heard about the book, Men are, for, uh, Men, are for, Men are for Mars, Women are for Venus? There's some real truth to that. Okay, We are trained and genetically programmed, and our brains are different. We don't talk about our feelings. We don't express ourselves. And there's a reason. When we lived in the caves, okay, back in the day, we went out and hunted. We were the protectors. We were the doers. I had to hunt and bring back the food to my family. And most often, I did that alone. I left my wife and my kids back at the cave. And what did she do? She took care of the kids. She gathered in the berries. And you guys know what they did? 
they sat and they kibitzed all day. They talked about their feelings. The women talked about problems. They talked about everything. We were alone hunting. And genetically, we're programmed to keep our feelings inside. We go to our caves to solve problems. How often have we heard our wives say to us, you don't tell me anything. You don't talk to me. And you go, what's there to talk about? Or how many times, guys, have you heard your wives say to you, you don't understand. You don't listen to me. And you go, what do you mean? I just heard everything you said. And we sit there, and as they're talking, we're trying to fix the problem. And they say, just listen to me. Well, wh why should I? We need to fix this. So we are protectors. We are doers. We are earners. We are in control. And we don't talk about our feelings. That doesn't bode well for dealing with a chronic illness. We like fixing problems, but we can't fix MS. You can't do the things that we can't do the things we see as defining our identity. So we have a sense of loss of self-worth. If I can't do and I can't fix, and that's who I think I am, I start to question, who am I? What is my self-value? What do I have to contribute? So MS robs us of our very identity. It is an obstacle. Where's frustration? And then there is the depression because of the loss. Um, we are doers. And again, what happens when we can't do it? So often, we define ourselves by our work and how we are affected if we need to change how we work. We're producers. You know, you, you used to walk down the old cemeteries and you would see on the headstones, Mrs. So-and-so, blah, 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 to blah, 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 wife, mother, grandmother. And you walk by, Mr. So-and-so, and what you saw was father, CEO, or electrician. So often, as a guy, our lives are defined about what we do, not who we are. That has to change. That's a problem if we start to lose what we do. Another obstacle, and I talked about a little bit about this already, we're uncomfortable talking about emotions, OK? We try to protect our families from our problems. We are providers. It's very difficult for us to ask for help or receive any support. We're taught we must do it on our own. You know, wh why do you guys think we like sports, OK? Most guys. Not every, every guy, but, you know, we like sports. Why? Because we can sit there and solve problems as they go on. I can't believe he threw that pass. He wasn't even open. We solve problems as we watch sports. That's why men are often attracted to spectator sports. Another obstacle is we need to redefine our work. We need to find strength elsewhere. As I said, as a, as a society, we value working. But sometimes we work on too much. We, we focus on work too much. Okay, So often, we as guys neglect our families, ourselves. We become workaholics. And sometimes, you know, MS gives us an opportunity to reevaluate who we are and what our priorities are in life. I was sharing earlier this evening, I was involved in a study back at the University of Miami in which we as psychologists hypothesized that most people that go through 
a chronic illness will be devastated and it will long ha have long-term effects. And it was interesting because we found a group of people that actually life improved after the diagnosis. And we started to interview those people. And you know what they told us? They had to reprioritize their life. They had to find what there was meaningful in their life because they could no longer work or do things that they did before. And so they found life and reprioritized and found more meaning in their lives. And there's two coping strategies that we identified. One was emotional reactive, and those were the people that did not do as well. And then there was the problem solvers, and those were the people that did better with the diagnosis of a chronic illness. So we really need to find strength. We need to focus on other aspects of our life. Focus on the family. Reconnect with friends. Do something about MS. That's what we're here for this evening. Join a support group and get to know the MS community. Set achievable goals and get started. The other obstacle, and, and Dr. Stango addressed this, is MS does affect marriage and our, our partnership. How many of you guys are in either married or in um, a relationship? All right, m most of you all are. So one other obstacle to overcome is how this affects your marriage. Yeah. <laughs> Well, hopefully we'll give you a little advice. Get out of the cave. <laughs> and, and we see that what's happened is all of a sudden marriage's not what we expected it. We may need to renegotiate roles. I may not have that role of protector or fixer. We also, as Dr. Stango talked about, MS affects us sexually. Oh, and you want to talk about self-worth, guys. That's who we are. I mean, we, 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 we got to drive big cars and fancy cars because it makes us feel sexually viral. And when our own sexuality comes into question, it really cuts to the core. So we really need to rethink about sexuality. And going back to this, this is... Interesting how we have to change our roles in our marriage. I kind of think that in my, my mind that there are very many different types of relationships. And I categorize relationships in, in, as being three types. The traditional relationship, where we take on the stereotypic roles, where I am the provider, I'm the man of the house, and I have my wife does the domestic th chores, I do all of the physical chores, and it's the traditional marriage. The other type of relationship is one I call the partnership. And that's kind of evolved out of you know, the, the women's movement, the feminist movement, where we need to do everything equal. I do the laundry, you take out the garbage. I take care of the finances, you take care of the kids. So in a partnership, we've agreed that it's 50-50. The last type of relationship is what I call the collegial relationship. And that is where I recognize my strengths, my weaknesses, my partner's strengths and weaknesses, and we work it out. It may not be 50-50. It may be 75, 25, but we, becomes co we become colleagues in this marriage. We become colleagues in this relationship. And that's what I'm hoping that you start to think about when you're dealing with the obstacles of MS, that maybe, 
You need to redefine your relationship and change it from a traditional partnership to a more of a collegial relationship. As Dr. Steingo said, MS does affect us sexually. It affects our ability to perform. It, affect, it affects intimacy. It affects the very core of who we are sexually. And when I, when I conceptualize relationships, and we've done some study, and when we go back and we look at the history of man, we recognize that throughout the history of man, there's this myth of marriage. And the myth of marriage is always that there's something greater than ourselves that brought us together. Oh, that we may believe it was God brought us together, or a higher power, or that this person is my soulmate. But if all the people are out of the women in the world, how is it you chose the woman you're with or the partner you're with? And so often, as time goes on, we forget about that. We raise children, we work hard, and we forget about the very thing that brought us together. That's where MS can help us redefine our relationships and help us work on that relationship and recognize what it is that brought us together. Because I'm going to tell you, it isn't the sex. Oh, guys, we may want to believe we were powerful in bed, and that's why she married us. But it wasn't that at all. Trust me. Ask her. She'll tell you. You weren't as good as you thought you were. <laughs> but she led you to believe you were. <laughs> So what becomes important is to be able to express respect. Um, and, and we talk about saying it, not just doing it. Feeling and thinking are not enough. We need to express our feelings to our partner. Um, don't make any assumptions in the relationship. What we're really talking about is helping you all deepen your relationships Okay, um, thank, say thanks for the little things. And as I said, redefine that relationship. Move from a, demo from a dictatorship to a democracy. You know, the other obstacle and, and is so important with MS. And guys, as I said, we have a tendency to withdraw and isolate. I can't tell you how important social support is to marital satisfaction. Go on a date. Go on a date with your wife <laughs> or your partner. Or don't tell your wife. You better know. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, what women want, OK, is they want to feel understood, OK? They want communication. And again, this is an opportunity to overcome those obstacles and deepen your relationships. Remember that sex, what sex is really about, and we can learn this from women, enjoy the ride. It's not just the destination. So it's not just about orgasm. It's not just about ejaculation. It could be about the relationship and feeling close and intimate. I know this is a foreign language, guys, but um, it works. All right, so let's talk about what do we find um, solutions. I, I know David Letterman um, is no longer in the air, but he always had the top five list. So this is my top five list in overcoming those obstacles. Number five, make connections. Connecting with others is the key way to strengthen your resilient, resilience. Tend MS support groups. Can't get in touch with a social worker that you have available to you through MS. Socialize. Reconnect with friends. 
the power of social support, we know this from research, reduces depression, helps manage stress, leads to better quality of life, promotes health, reconnect with friends, join a group. One of the things we look at as a psychologist when we're looking at suicide potential is, is there social support? One of the best predictors of someone who will commit suicide is they don't have any social support. Social support is critical in helping us overcome obstacles. Number four on Letterman's list, make achievable goals. We're trying to help feel good about ourselves. Make achievable goals. Give it 1% harder. Do 1% more. Small changes equal big results. This comes right out of Pat Riley's book. Three, take action. Do something every day for yourself. Make small progress towards your goals. That'll give you a sense of feeling of accomplishment. Do something about MS. Number two, give. Helping others is one of the best ways to help yourself. Alcohol Anonymous was founded on way back in the day because there was no help for addictions. And two people got together and they helped each other. And they recognized that by helping each other, they helped themselves. So give. It's a proven antidepressant. It's a great way to make connections. And number one, maintain hope. It's OK to hope. Hope is justified. We're in a new era of MS knowledge and treatment. If you remembered what Dr. Steingo said about all the medications, there's more medications that came out in 2014, it looked like, than since 1993. There is hope. So let's do it. It's tough being us, guys. We got a raw deal. It's tougher being a man with MS. Focus on what you can do and achieve. So often, people ask me, Doc, what can I do about this? Change your attitude. Look at what you can do, not what you can't do. You haven't changed as a person. Focus on what you can do and achieve. Pay attention to your relationships. Have sex. It may be different than before. And work on strengthening your resilience. Thank you. So now we're going to begin the Q&A. Jeff has a question. With MS and anxiety, does that affect your judgment? Um, certainly anxiety can affect judgment, if it, but we need to be careful to help differentiate is it anxiety or a cognitive effect of the MS, a cognitive dysfunction of the MS. So we need to understand the, the degree of the anxiety um, and to really help differentiate is it, you know, the MS or is it the anxiety? Yeah. Um, and, and we know that with MS that there can be more difficulty making decisions, impulsivity, um, and other cognitive problems at all. So that, that, that's something I would want to talk to my neurologist about. Yeah. Dr. Sango, you have anything to back that up with? You want to go for, forward with it? Anything to say? Nothing? Okay, next. <laughs> so this MS thing can be quite embarrassing and pain in the ass. Um, so this whole thing about the ups and downs of the disease, you know, one day I'm 
walking with the cane, and the next day I'm in a wheelchair for a couple of days or a week or two, and then the next day I'm in it with a cane for another three, four months. So it's really crazy, all up and down like that type of thing. And the part that bothers me the most, I guess, is the stigma piece of it. So, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to say I've accepted the fact that I'm this thing bounces all over the place, but it's hard when you go around um, and people that you know that you worked with, because uh, I'm retired now because of the cognitive stuff, but the that you worked with and that you see quite frequently, like, and they look at you and they're confused. And they're like, well, weren't you just walking t yesterday? Or, you know, and, or, and you look so good, what's going on? And it's, it's so hard and so confusing to them, but also me. And so it gets very um, frustrating and angry. I get angry about it. And sometimes I just feel like I shouldn't leave the house. But I do, obviously. But sometimes I just really, really think about that. My own backyard is really the best place to be because there's a nice hammock there, you know? But it just pisses me off. I mean, the anger is certainly understandable. The, the, the best counter to stigma is education. And so often, if we could explain to our coworkers about what MS is and the symptoms, then they're going to understand. But what's also important is that we need to come to grips with our own feelings about MS and recognize and help change our thinking. Yeah, well, you know, today I might be in a wheelchair, but I've also been able to use a cane and be grateful for those days. And also to look at what I can do in that wheelchair and dial back my expectations to be more realistic and understand the, the disorder. But I, I think all of us, when we're dealing with a chronic illness, that anger is an appropriate emotion and understandable. How, how many of y'all has uh, experienced anger at the, the disease? Yeah, so it, it's not uncommon. Not uncommon. How are you, doctors? Um, a question uh, pertaining to sexual. Um, as I'm getting older, of course, I ha you know, I understand I'm getting older and everything, but I've noticed um, I don't maintain properly. I'll get an erection and it's not maintained during the sexual intercourse. And I've tried, like you said, Cialis, Viagra, to help with the erection, but it's not. I'll have to wait a while. By the time I'm waiting, my partner has already gotten cold. And to start again, it's hard. But I don't know what to do anymore, you know, because if these other pills to help with erection is supposed to help out, but on the contrary, is not helping me out. I don't know what else to do. You know, I, I of course, the years of marriage, I've been married already with my wife. Um, we'll go into foreplay and everything, but within myself keeping an erection, it's hard because I'm young. And I see myself at a young age having this problem, and it stresses me out. But like I said, I've tried Cialis, I've tried Viagra, and I don't see it's helping me. What do you recommend or think it could be? By the way, these questions don't always just have to go for the doctors to answer. If any guys here have like anything that, you know, like maybe could help out somebody else asking a question in this room, just raise your hand. Let me get over to you with the mic, you know, or I'll run back and forth. I mean, I would follow the sequence that I had on the slide. So the first thing that we evaluate is, is this due to MS? So let's assume you say you're a younger person, so you don't have other diseases. For example, someone could be diabetic, common cause of sexual dysfunction, so rule out other medical problems. 
you've clearly indicated you have the desire and you're ready for action and things are going on, so it doesn't seem like it's a problem with libido or desire or things like that. So if it comes down, then you've tried the medication. So you're looking now that the next step is that there are other things. And so on the one slide I showed that, some of the mechanical devices that are used are very effective. So you need to seek out a urologist with experience in this field. And using, for example, a ring or a vacuum pump are actually very effective. What they basically do, when, when, someone, when, when a person has an erection, what actually happens is that their blood, the penis is engorged with blood. That's what it is. That's what an erection is. So what happens is these devices, like a vacuum pump or a mechanical ring, retain the blood in the penis. And so someone can make, so you leave the ring on as long as you need it, and then at the end you would re release the ring, for example, and the penis would disengorge. Then there are other things. There's a pump that can actually be inserted, that's an inflatable pump that can be pumped up and then released, which will also maintain a longer erection. So there are prosthetic de devices that can help too. So I think if you see, if, you, if, if all the other measures you've spoken about have not worked, it's worthwhile to see an experienced urologist and find some mechanical device. Uh, it doesn't, maybe it makes it a little less spontaneous, but that, you know, sex doesn't have to be spontaneous. Sex can be a planned thing. I have more than one patient said to me, I have sex every Friday night, for example. I don't, I can't in my life, I just have accepted that the night we do it is Friday night. And that, that's, how, that's how sometimes, I think that's how it is sometimes. And so sometimes you might have to plan it ahead and get, you know, but I think it's good, to, you, you, the next step, if you haven't seen, have you seen a urologist? I'm supposed to see one in about probably two weeks. Okay, good. I have to see one because I've also, like you said, the ring, I've tried the ring. It helped out the first couple of times, but then after that, it the, wouldn't help. The other piece so common with you know, erect, erectile dysfunction is the psychological piece. So, so often, if I don't maintain erection, well, I start the sexual act, and I'm starting to worry or think about if I'm going to maintain my, reaction, my erection. And what happens then is with the symptom of anxiety, the, um, I'm going to lose blood flow to my penis and not be able to maintain erection. So the other thing that, that Dr. Steingo had on his slide is to see a sex therapist because there are other things that could be done. There are positions, sexual positions that can help maintain an erection. And the sex therapist can also help talk about the anxiety. And they work with the couple together. So there are things that can be done. So once you meet with urologist, you may also want to consider um, speaking with a sex therapist. Yeah, because I was also thinking maybe that had to do something with um, uh, incontinence of urine. Could that affect also the sexual desire? I mean, so the bladder, the, the nerves that control the bladder and the bowel uh, and the sexual organs are all coming from the same origin. And therefore, that's why I said earlier, it's very common. The things that are associated, you look at at a time when you'd have heightened concern about sexual function, are things like when there's bladder and bowel problems. And plus, how to control the bladder and the bowel. If, if someone's in the middle of a sex act and suddenly they, they have an urge to urinate or to have a bowel movement, I mean, that can be, that can kind of affect the atmosphere quite a bit, right? I would think. So these things need to be, you need to learn how to control these things. So if someone has incontinence, uh, if they're under pressure and, bladder and they have an urge, you have to learn emptying the bladder and things like that. But those problems are all interrelated with each other very much. But you might have a fear of incontinence. And so this is where you talk to, have communication with a partner. And a partner is understanding. So I understand you have this disease and something could happen. I'm, I'm going to accept it, that it could happen. So communication, the psychological aspects of communication are all very important. Yeah, no, thank God that with my wife, the communication is there. That's awesome. You know, 26 years, the communication is there, so she's understandable, you know. But uh, it's just something that, at my age, I never saw myself in this position. You know, it's like when I was in my teens, um, I was, you could say, like a lion. Now I'm a freaking kitty cat. <laughs> so it's, it's hard but, but, at my age. You know, but you, but you there's, there's something to be huh? said for kitty cats. <laughs> Thanks. 
I wouldn't um, say you're a kitty cat. You're just an old lion. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> what What about just low testosterone? I mean, what will that do for well, no, anybody? Well, no, that's one of the things we had listed over exactly. there. Exactly. This is part of the evaluation. If you see the urologist, he's going to measure the testosterone level. And there are many people with MS that have had, you know, we find they have low testosterone. We give them testosterone, whatever formulation is given, like a gel, for example, a patch, and then they feel better. Their sexual function improves. But in addition to that, they often feel better. They say, well, I feel more energy. So it helps other aspects of, 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 of MS as well, symptomatic aspects as well. So another, another aspect that I hear about a lot that, uh, you know, I, I, also, I also suffer from this is that, um, yeah, I can have the erection, but that have no sensitivity. And I can't always achieve orgasm because I'm not feeling what's going on. And it doesn't matter on the position. I mean, I, I can do everything. But, but, it do, but it doesn't help if you can't feel. Yeah, so that go, <coughs> excuse me, that, that goes to what Dr. Harris. Oh. You go ahead. Oh. I don't know where he was going with that. It kind of dumped me on that. <laughs> we were doing a duet here. I'm not sure what you, my... You didn't come together. I know that much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What I was, what I was going to say, why I point to him, and now we're talking about this is... Then it becomes psychological. There's nothing physical that can restore you if you can't feel because of numbness. There is no drug that we have that restores numbness. If you have numbness in your fingertips or your toes or the tip of your nose, hmm, Dr. Seuss, if you have numbness anywhere... There is no medication that restores numbness. So when you have numbness, then you have to start thinking about things. And I told you before, some visualization techniques. And this is where you heard about a sex therapist. You go and see, I quoted the one over there, Frederick Foley. But we have some in Broward County, we have others. And they will teach you visualization. That's when you need to start using some mind over matter. And I mean, isn't part of having sexual activity visualization? Do we sometimes fantasize that we're with, you know, some other, you know, Starlet or somebody? I'm not sure if you were in the room when we, we talked about, Stu, the slide. Sometimes yeah. it's the journey, not the destination. I don't think you got that, did he? I did. Right. Well, you did. Well, uh, like... I'm on the journey a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Stungo, I understand that the erectile dysfunction drugs will help us stay hard and keep our erection if that's possible. And I, you just answered my question, if there was anything that would help us with sensation, anything that would help us, and I, I think I'm reaching that point now because I've also noticed some, some bowel and bladder issues developing also, where if I have to use the restroom, I should have used it 10 minutes ago, not at the moment that I feel like my bladder is full. In the same way with an erection, I, I can have an erection, keep the erection, but I lose sensation. And in my case, when I become overstimulated, over I develop pain in my lower limbs. And it, it is when my, my feet hurt and, and my legs hurt the most. So we have to manage all the symptoms. So some of them that I uh, listed there as well was things like spasms and spasticity. In the middle of this activity going on, someone could have spasticity in their legs. They could have spasms. I mean, these could also kind of, you know, screw things up a bit, if you could use that term in this situation. <laughs> or maybe I'd say they don't screw things up a bit. Well, they screw things up, but there's, but there's no screwing. No, we shouldn't say this. I don't know. You know, it could play on these words. But no, so, so, you're, so, so numbness, like we said, you can get creams. There are creams out there. Most of them are on the Internet. There's all kinds of places that sell creams. Heightened sexual activity. And what they usually do, a lot of those, is they just, they, they bring, oftentimes they'll bring blood to the skin, they'll irritate nerves, they'll cause a lot of tingling, they'll heighten activity. So there are some creams out there that can be tried as well to try and heighten the sensation. I don't think they often work very well. And I think if, if there is true loss of feeling like numbness, uh, a lot of visualization techniques and, and a sex therapist are very helpful in those regards. I think the creams often are, are not that helpful when there's numbness. Coming from the more of the center of the state, the Treasure Coast area, currently we do not have a neurologist who has much information, a urologist, I'm sorry, a urologist who has much information in MS. Is there someone here in South Florida that you usually recommend to? Uh, yeah, there are a few neurologists around here that I have sent patients to that have, uh, sure. Okay. Yes, there are. Good, so after the talk, we'll, we'll get together. All right. Good. All right, next. Yeah, Doc, on the same thing of pain, um, the 
the drugs don't help with the pain. I mean, I can get an erection, and then when the pain starts, it, you just lose it. So is there anything else you can do for that? So pain, which, what kind of pain are you Well, I have to? two problems. I have the MS pain in my legs, like you're saying, the spasticity, but I also have two failback surgeries. And so sometimes when I move, the pain will happen, and then, uh, then everything is just done. I mean, so whether you move from sexual activity or whether you move because you, you know, turned around to pick something up or you bent over, I mean, that is treated the same. Whatever's treating off the pain, it's, it's pain management that you're talking about. Right. And I assume if you've had two failed back surgeries that you've been in pain management. Yes. Or are in pain management. Yes, correct. And there has to be some kind of pain management. And maybe if you have pain management, most people that are in pain management have drugs that they take on a chronic basis, on a but daily basis. But then the basis. fatigue hits in and then... Yeah, it's but, the, but you also have medications that you take PRN or as correct, needed. Correct, correct. So someone would say, I'm taking X medication regularly, twice a day, but intermittently my pain flares up, and then I have to take an extra dose of some narcotic or some pain, strong pain medication. Well, potentially if your pain is very severe, be a second, potentially if your pain is very severe, you might be able to preempt it. Maybe you could say to the pain management doctor, can I take, and you don't have to even tell him, you don't have to tell him about your sex life. Maybe if you have a PRN medication that is effective, then if you know that you're going to get pain by this activity, you try it before this activity. I mean, that's what I could recommend. Th other than that, it's all to do with pain management. There's also other forms of treatment like biofeedback, learning muscle relaxation, that can be really helpful in pain management. The other question, one more question. Please. Um, I get the um, Botox treatment. Does that affect it at all? I get Botox shots for my bladder. Will that affect sex? No, I mean, not usually. So usually if the Botox is into, injected into your bladder, it's going to affect your bladder muscles and won't have any... I mean, sometimes Botox can spread out and affect other parts of the body, but other muscles. But no, in general, it won't affect uh, sexual function. In response to... Yes. So one of the things that the uh, doctor gave me, because I was having a similar problem of of starting but not uh, completing, was a drug called Muse, which is apparently a very old medication um, that doesn't work for everybody, but it's certainly something that you might give a try. And it worked fine for me, so it's always worth a try. For the name itself means fun. <laughs> Does it really? Muse. Oh. <laughs> so with the... Um, uh, the cock ring and the uh, muse, it seems to help make a difference. My question um, for you, uh, Dr. Steingo, is how important is it to ejaculate or to, or to empty yourself, I guess, or to maintain the pipes? Um, <laughs> Clean the plumbing out. Yeah, I... I, I, I I don't think, I mean, if you're, if you're saying, is there, if you don't ejaculate, is it unhealthy? I don't, I don't think that's the case. I mean, it's the same as when we were like 12 and 13 and, you know, playing around in the bathroom and, and we were told in certain societies and certain cultures that that's very bad for you and you're not going to go to heaven, you're going to go to hell. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's unhealthy for you if you don't complete the act in that way. I have a question. I'm thinking about going on disability. I have issues with my feet, detangling the burning. Then I had a comment made to me in my review recently before I left on the injury for my fractured leg, because I had fractured that when I'd seen you recently. You're not processing transactions fast enough. It's like, you know what, you get tired of enough's enough already. They know I have MS, back off. What's the issue? Why do you complicate things? Not me, them. I'm just, I've had it up to here, I've had enough. I'm thinking about going on disability because my leg is hurting me constantly now because, yes, the fracture healed, but I'm going to have pain there for a long time. I don't smile a lot. I'm not mad at my customers. And I told some, hey, listen, I'm not smiling. It's not that I'm mad at you. I'm dealing with MS. They say, I'm sorry. It's okay. I appreciate it. I said, I'm happy I can get out of bed. I can see you and have a conversation with you. But you get to the point where enough's enough. Stop telling me I'm not working fast enough. And I've had even my manager said to me a year and a half ago, maybe you should go on disability. Well, I wasn't ready then. Now I'm thinking about maybe I should, but I don't know what I need to do to go to that next step. I'm not trying to beat the system, but a lot of my friends have said, Lane, you're not taking advantage of the system. You have a medical condition. You have an illness. You're entitled. I mean, I'm trying to be fair. I'm not trying to milk the system. 
because I've worked all these years when I got out of college. I paid my taxes. There's other things that I focus on when I'm not at work that doesn't stress me as much, but I also have a problem. I have an issue. I have to run to the bathroom. They've noticed I go to the bathroom quite a bit. Sometimes I'm in the bathroom. I can't go. I don't know if it's from the MS or from the stress. I don't know what to do. I mean, it's all of the above. You don't separate one from the other, right? Like going to the bathroom. Are they noticing that? I mean, so like I said to you before, the most important thing about disability is to be, just prepare for it, which means have things documented. What should I do at this point? May, I can't, that's what I've told, said before. I can't tell you when... No, no, I know, but should I start documenting things or should I yes, contact Yes, you should attorney? document it and you should see your neurologist and it should be in the medical record that you're having ex these following problems. Mm -hmm. So when Social Security mm -hmm. or the private insurance disability carrier writes to me, and says, you know, why is this person disabled? And they look at my note, and it doesn't even mention the word disability. That is a screw up. It needs to say that. It needs to be discussed in my note. So when I see the worst thing that happens to me is I get surprised. I get a note. I just saw someone three weeks ago, and all of a sudden a note comes from Social Security and says, disability, send us the last three, the last three months of notes on, you know, on John Smith. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the word disability isn't even mentioned there. Mm -hmm. And guess what happens to John Smith's disability claim? Down the, down the drain. Mm -hmm. It's got no chance right out of the gate. So the next it's step is I should go to a urologist? No, you, you need to go to whatever your problems are. It needs to be documented. If you have pain and burning in your feet, mm -hmm. then your neurologist needs to, then you need to say, this, these are my problems. So and we to... talk, yes, we talk, need to talk about these issues okay. and put them in the note I, and, and discuss it. It can actually be a point of discussion. Okay. That we have today on this visit discussed disability and, and we have discussed disability because of pain and burning in the feet, fatigue, bladder problems and memory loss. Okay. So when so you do apply for disability, mm -hmm. that it's all there. And then we would look at it and then I'd say to you, I think you've got a very good case. Or I'd say, you know what? Let's be prepared for this. Maybe you need to speak to a social worker first or maybe, you know, Jennifer Falk, the MS Society, the social workers out there. Or I might even say, you know what? You maybe need to speak to, to even to a disability attorney first. Decide what steps to take. I want to do it the right way because you know what? You get to the point where I'm not... 21 years old anymore. I'm 50. I'm not trying to, like I said, having them, hey, Lane, you're taking advantage. No. You get to the point where you're dealing with an issue and it's like, stop beating it into my head. I know maybe I'll not be the fastest one. You said something worrisome to me, though. You said somebody at work said, talk, spoke to you something about disability. So as I said before, the thing that happens that is the most scary thing to me is that they don't actually, that they come up to you and they say, well, then your job is now closed. We don't, you know, you, we're letting you go. And it's not because you have MS, you know. It's not because you have MS. Right. It's because we're letting you go. Right. Because the job's not there anymore. Of course, they hire someone two weeks later, but it's not there anymore. Right. Now, if you let go, what do you have? Do you have health insurance? Do you get COBRA? Yes. But there's no COBRA for disability. You're in trouble. You've got no disability. Now I'm basically up the creek without a paddle. Pardon so the therefore, I'm saying right. in some situations, if somebody even thinks about it or you think about it, Go on short-term leave to start with. At least then, then you're, now you're safe. You're in a, like a protected zone until you can then, now you have a little bit of time, well, I was a on couple short of months to make, your to make your decision. Like I said, documentation is very important. All right, he'll take up anything else separately. He'll take up anything else personally separately with this. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have questions? With three, uh, three orgasms, do you think that's too many in a sudden or? You know, when you have, were you looking at me hard or? I think you can pull the audience. What's that? <laughs> hey guys, what do you think of three orgasms? <laughs> well, I mean, are you pushing the. Wait, wait, he's talking about over a month. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a thingy. I will it hurt your system. And this one's for you, sir. Now, do you think we'll have a different. Uh, uh, oh, do you think we'll be able to get a, a different, like, GI doctor or something like that, maybe one a time? GI doctor? Yeah, or you well, we've, Maybe. Had, we've, had, we've had urologists in the past, and I'm sure we'll do it again. <coughs> right. yeah, cool. in, fact, in fact, at our symposium coming up in November, there'll be a urologist there. So, Okay? All right. Give them some slack. Okay. And we were talking about erections and sex before, and then we have this person here talking about milking the system. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? That's it? So we're going to let the women back in the room. Are you all happy that you had this talk today? Good. Glad to hear it. I do again want to thank you all for coming.
And I do want to thank the one that gave us the dollars to do tonight's program. And so I want to thank, again, Genzyme, a Santa Fe company. Thank you. Thank you.